The Professor's Wives by James Beecham Starr, first published in The Occult Digest, Volume 1, Number 2, February, March, 1925. I am lonely. I am lonelier than I ever was before. From her couch, the tall, tawny-haired girl made a motion of self-pity, uttered the phrases slowly and with difficulty, and waited. The professor did not speak. She dropped her eyes and voice. You do not care. There was a final note in the last. He knew she would not speak again unless he answered. Why are you lonely? I have been thinking, she said, slowly from among her pillows, of a great many things. You are not satisfied with. He indicated the furnishings of their home in a comprehensive wave of his hand and allowed the sentence to go unfinished. The room was pink and silver. The ceiling was azure clouds among which naked fairies floated scattering flowers. The light was sifted through opaque globes. I appreciate it all, she said drearily, with her eyes fixed upon him in passionate despair. And your goodness. But we live here day after day, sharing everything except your thoughts. You have a life of your own that you live alone, that I do not share, a world, a dream, I do not know exactly what. Only you leave me behind. I know how far dreams used to carry me, away from life and disappointments. Your dreams are different, but they do the same for you. I am lonelier than I used to be. I can't dream anymore, yet I see you dream and know I may not go where you are going. The fault is entirely mine, my dear, he said gently. An old man whose best years have passed should not have been so selfish. I had no right to take your youth and expect you to drift along in contentment, in my declining age, finish a life's work. However, my experiments are now at the point where I must shut myself up for days and nights at a time. Yesterday, I sent my subconscious mind into the great beyond and held converse with my first wife. I know you are too sensible to be jealous of the dead, so I do not hesitate to speak of these matters to you. There was and is a close affinity between our souls, and she is trying to impart some things of vital importance to me. Always, it seems, a disturbing influence comes between us, just at the instant she is about to warn me of impending disaster. Something of the kind occurred yesterday, and I was ill all last night. But, Vashi, in a year, my experiments will be at an end and the book completed. Bear with me that long. My work will be finished, and I will make up to you for the loneliness you are suffering now. A vague flush that faded to intense pallor swept her face as anguish sometimes sweeps over one who can bear no more. She rose from her cushions and went to his side, resting the palms of her hands on his shoulders. But I love you, she drew his head down to hers. Oh, don't tell me of your first wife. I'm not jealous, but she is dead, and I'm here, and I need you. The professor laughed amusedly. I think I understand, Vashi, he said. We shall go to the opera tonight, and I shall have to devote more time to my sweet young wife, or she will be drifting away from me. For a week he did, and she was radiant. Vashi's first impulse, when the professor again lapsed to neglect, was passive indignation. This she tried to veil even from herself, but soon self-pity once again took its place. During the days and nights, he remained secluded, shut up in his study. She brooded until finally, she brought her mind to the point where she considered herself a martyr. This time, she refused to conquer with reproaches that which she imagined was indifference. Being a healthy young girl and proud, she quickly realized such a course could not continue. Therefore, casting around for amusement, it was with real pleasure she welcomed Herbert Marsh. He entered the room with his usual confidence, glancing curiously around as the mauve and gold portier settled into place after his entrance. Vashi, lithe, blonde, and beautiful, felt a quick thrill of relief as she listened to the firm tread of the departing professor. He had excused himself for the evening. A chapter of his book remained unfinished a week. There was also an experiment he had in mind for some time past. His spirit control, the late departed, Mrs. Professor No. 1, had vainly endeavored several times to get into communication with him, or rather he with her, but the barrier was always raised at the critical time. Would Vashi forgive him if he left her to her own devices for a few days while he tried to overcome the evil influence? which, as he laughingly put it, short-circuited the spirit bond between his first wife and himself. 
She had assented with good-natured impatience. Really, Adam, another woman would be jealous of the first Mrs. Armitage. She noticed his frown and hastened to assure him. Of course, dear, I understand. Go along to your seance or whatever you call it, and this time find out who or what the evil influence really is. She smiled doubtfully. I wonder if it could be I. I wonder, murmured the professor, as he entered his study and closed the door. Vashi turned to her caller. Herbert Marsh, she exclaimed. The very person to help pass a few tiresome hours. The professor has deserted me for the evening. Sit down, she commanded in a tone of gentle dictation. I am going to allow you to tell me that which you have intended for years. She laughed softly, although a trifle hysterically. Begin, you love me. She stood unblushing, unabashed. Her eyes showed not desire, but despair. You are right, Vashi, he said. It was my intention to force the issue tonight, and I am glad you meet me halfway. You know we have been friends, always, I think. And Vashi, you are not happy. Girl, you are twenty, and he is fifty. He neglects you. She felt that even under the influence of his passion, there was insincerity. Still, she stood smiling, waiting. You were made for love, for kisses. Vashi, I love you. She swayed toward him, strengthless, dizzy with the sense of the professor's neglect. She felt like one standing, gazing into a chasm. There came a wild, uncontrollable desire to fall. She tried to speak and failed. In the space of a minute, the whole world had changed for her. Knowledge of the professor's apparent indifference to her was public property, it seemed. Everyone, she supposed, noticed and spoke of it. Nothing mattered now. Nothing was rose and gold. The mauve portier was leaden. The perfume of the banked roses suffocated her. I'm so miserable, she wailed. She reeled, and his arms received her. Held there, she lost a moment of consciousness, awakening to his kisses on her lips. Then came reaction, realization of her weakness. Angrily, she flung him from her. You dressed up, pampered, sleek tomcat, she cried. He shrank from her as from a blow. She laughed wildly, shrilly. Why don't you arch your back and spring on me, snarling? She laughed amusedly at the conceit then slink away to some alley, looking for a less aristocratic love, like your feline brothers do. There was a moment of silence, then. Adam Armitage is at least a man. You, you are a beast that only brute passions can arouse. She pointed to the gold and mauve portieres. In silence, he went out of the room, and to her eyes the splendid hangings fell in faded folds behind him. Vashi hurried to the professor's study at once and knocked. There was no response, and quietly, she turned the knob. She found him stretched on the floor. The leaping flames from the embers in the grate disclosed a pallid face, a hanging jaw, and wide staring eyes that saw nothing. She gazed at him, fascinated. He stirred uneasily and broke the spell. He rose on his arm like one unaware. Adam, she cried, you frighten me. You are ill. Speak, dear, she went on feverishly, clasping and unclasping her hands. He looked at her languidly. I was in communication with the spirit of Edith, he mumbled. She tried to warn me of something, some terrible impending evil. My brain seemed to snap. A myriad of lights blinded me, and then came darkness. His wife threw herself on the floor, entwined her arms about his head, and kissed his brow with unrestrained passion. Promise me you will give up these awful experiments, my own, she pleaded. You are tampering with the laws of the Almighty. Oh, I want you, Adam. The other woman is dead. I am alive to love. Perhaps you are right, he said gently. I will not deny that it is a sacrifice, but your love is worthy of it. She assisted him to his feet. I will help you to bed, dear, she said. You are ill. Let me stay beside you and chase the bad dreams away. Adam, said Vashi, opening his study door and putting in her yellow head, perched on one side like a saucy canary. I am going out. Very well, dear, said the professor, and smiled at her, his willingness to be left alone showing in his soft gray eyes. She blew him a kiss and was gone. Out in the street, she hurried to a taxi stand and stepped into the first empty machine. The address she handed the driver was that of a large studio building and the smooth wheels sped over the pavement, hurrying her to her appointment with André Daudet. She lay back against the upholstery, with eyes closed, considering her course and trying to define her purpose. 
The urge had been so strong it had overcome her reason. Today, she said aloud, I shall allow him to make love. She laughed. Perhaps if he insists prettily, I shall even pose for him, as he wants me to do. The machine slid up to a curb, and the driver held the door open. Inside the building, she entered an elevator and stepped out at the artist's floor. The dapper little Frenchman was waiting for her with snappy eyes and nervous hands. He loosened her wraps and drew her down to a pillow-covered couch, exclaiming with sharp, abrupt French phrases his admiration and delight. Perfect, he cried. Madam, you are a dream. The portrait? Bah! Let me paint you as Dieu made you. It will be the masterpiece. It is not vulgarity. It is art. You are art. Who will recognize the wealthy Madame Armitage? Who suspect? He knelt and smoothed the laces at her neck. Perhaps she half consented. He almost squealed his delight, fluttering around her like a mad butterfly. A touch of his finger on her shoulders and they drooped more gracefully. He tilted her head and the light caught her eyes and they showed now gray, now blue, now green, dreamy and pensive. Ah, madam, he cried, I make it breathe. I make it live, you shall see. I put in what no other painter could. I put in life and love. He passed a caressing hand under her waist and drew her to him. And now just one little kiss. Apparently, for the moment, she had forgotten the existence of the artist, ignoring his bold hand. She reached absently for a palette knife and without warning, slapped his face with the wide, flexible blade. Then she fled the room. I will not be back, she called to him as she closed the door behind her. Adam, Adam, what is it? She cried. She had hastened to his study as quickly as she returned from the artist's studio. He was lying back in his chair, beads of sweat stood on his white forehead, and his hair hung in damp strands. He turned his eyes to her and addressed a mute appeal. I have been to sit for my portrait, she told him. I did not imagine you were feeling ill. Let me call a doctor. He shook his head. I am better now, he attempted a wan smile. I am continually frightening you, Vashi. He drew her close to him. I dozed in my chair and dreamed. Oh, I don't know what I dreamed. Only you were in danger. She kissed him. But you see, I am all right, she assured him. And about my portrait, I don't intend having it finished. It's a bore, and beside, I've an idea. Daude is overestimated. Send him a check, dear, and a note saying, the strain of posing is too much for me. Really, I believe my physical culture course is doing me a world of good, Vashi remarked to her husband. You know I was becoming inclined to him bon point. Now my muscles are as hard and firm as when I was a child. Why don't you enroll and have Professor Flanagan show you how to work off your lazy fat? Too busy, he told her. A few months more, Vashi, and we can shut up the house and lounge away a season in the country. Yes, and get softer and fatter every day. Still, wistfully, I wish your stupid old book was finished now so I could have you all to myself. A pause. It's a dreary day. I think I'll call the professor up and make arrangements for a lesson this afternoon. A rainy day gives me the horrors. Will you have the car sent around? As you please, he told her. She phoned to the gym and the professor informed her he was absolutely at leisure. On account of the rain, not one of his pupils had showed up. A half hour later, attired in midi, bloomers and black silk stockings, Vashi stood on the polished floor with skipping rope in hand. The ugly, brutish face of the pugist instructor grimaced when his female assistant interrupted to show him a note. Her mother had been suddenly taken ill, and she asked, might she go home at once? I am sorry, Mrs. Armitage, he apologized. It is a case of sickness, and I cannot refuse the girl. I am afraid we shall have to postpone the lesson. It doesn't matter, she said. Let her go. I am here now, and no one else is likely to come on account of the weather, so I may as well stay. I can lock the door and not admit anyone, he suggested. Do so, she told him. The attendant departed, and the professor dropped the dead latch. Clever girl, he remarked, never sticks around when she's not needed. Vashi threw herself on a rattan couch. Professor, she laughed, do you mean to tell me the message was simply an excuse for the girl leaving? She stretched her supple body full length, and he sat down beside her. She looked at him in surprise. Why not, he asked, and leaned over and kissed her. 
She was too astounded to resist, and it was a full minute before she managed to release herself from his embrace. Surely, why not, she said quietly. It is the usual procedure, I suppose. Only, you picked the wrong woman this time. She sprang to her feet and struck him a stinging blow in the mouth, cutting her knuckles on his teeth. What do you mean, he snarled. You expected it, didn't you? You called up on a rainy day to make sure nobody would bother us. Didn't you tell the girl to go? And didn't you say in front of her that you wanted the door locked? Yes, she admitted. I did. But you work crudely, Professor. She glanced toward the dressing room. I am going to change to street costume, and in my handbag I have a beautiful little twenty-two. It has the dearest carved ivory grips. She closed the door behind her, and from the gym side, the professor listened to her description of how straight she could shoot. Presently, she stood before him, throwing her raincoat over her shoulders. She turned the dead latch, and he made no effort to detain her. Goodbye, professor, she called from the hallway. Your lessons have developed me wonderfully, but I find it all too strenuous. You advertise, no punishment. Now that is misleading, for my knuckles will be a week in healing. Her husband was recovering from a trance when she entered his room. He crushed her dripping form to him. I dreamed you fell in the gymnasium, he cried. How glad I am to see you unharmed. Gently, she disengaged his arms. I only slipped a little, dear, she told him. You are getting all wet from my raincoat. Let me go to my room and change. You see, I am so accustomed to coming home and finding you ill that you may think I am becoming calloused. I truly wish you would listen to me and give up these terrible experiments. Someday an evil spirit may sometime impart knowledge to you that would be better left unknown. I will come back, dear, as quickly as I have gotten into a gown. The professor's health began failing rapidly, and through Vashi's persistent entreaties, he consented to take a helper. The trouble, they both admitted, would be the finding of a suitable person someone who understood the character of the professor's work and could enter into it with sympathy and competence. A few weeks later, Carl Stanger appeared. Where he came from, he did not say. He had answered the professor's advertisement and proved his ability by showing he knew more of mesmerism, hypnotism, spiritualism, and the allied occult isms than the professor imagined possible for any one man to know. The applicant hinted of difficulties with his family in Europe and ask that he be taken on merit alone and without question of his antecedents or allowed to depart in search of another situation. The professor accepted him on his own conditions. From the day Carl Stanger entered the Armitage home, work progressed rapidly. As the book neared completion, the professor delved less and less frequently into the unknown. Immediately, he attempted to enter the spirit state. The stronger will of the younger man drew him irresistibly back until, without suspecting the cause, he began to think he was no longer in sympathy with his spirit control. Then commenced a series of queer experiences for both Vashi and the professor. You want to know what? Stanger would ask. Where is my wife? The professor sometimes inquired. Close your eyes. Before him, in detail, every movement of Vashi at the instant would appear. Perhaps she was about to step into her bath. It might be that her man dressmaker was at an interesting point in the fitting of a frock. Again, she lay in bed, weeping. Stanger's fingers snapped. Awake! The professor's eyes blinked as he looked around, doubtfully, fearfully. Young man, your power is marvelous. God grant you use it to a good purpose. What am I thinking about? Vashi asked him one day. Do you want me to show you, and apparently, cause it to come true? You understand, of course, that it will be only a condition of mind. Call it a phantasm, a hallucination, if you wish. She blushed and nodded. When he snapped his fingers a few minutes later, she avoided his eye and hurried to her room. From the top of the stairs, she called, I think, Mr. Stanger, you had better see if the professor is all right. I imagine he is ill. During the days following, she glanced up with awed, beseeching eyes whenever she felt Stanger's gaze upon her. By the time the last page of the manuscript was typed, the professor was very ill, his energy having been used up by overwork. He sat in his study chair, turning the loose pages in his hands when Vashi entered and stood looking at his thin face. 
My dear, he said, laying the work aside, it is finished, and Mr. Stanger insists that he leave us tonight. I want to know if you can spare us a couple of hours. For some time past, I have been unable to get into communication with the spirit world, but our friend has promised me a wonderful experience before he goes. I am tempted at times to believe the young man is really a departed spirit masquerading in human form. She looked frightened. Oh, Adam, I don't dare to. Something terrible will happen. I am afraid. Stanger rose from his seat in the shadows where he sat unobserved and stepped directly in front of her. Stay, he commanded. Your husband has continually tortured you with references to his first wife. You do not deserve such treatment, and I intend teaching him a lesson. She sank down weakly in a chair, and the mystic brushed the palm of his hand across her brow. He swung quickly toward the professor and caught his eye. The form in the desk chair relaxed. The arms and legs hung limply. Look on the result of your folly, bungler, he cried. You, who attempted to peer into the unseen world with your weak, half-seeing eyes, look at that which went on while you groped. Vashi sat in her chair, rigid, dumb, her mind an absolute blank, while before her husband's eyes passed one after the other, her mental indiscretions. At the critical moment in each situation, a spasm of pain swept over the professor's face. Then he would see her coming into his study, finding him unconscious, reviving, and comforting him. As the last picture faded, he again heard Stanger's voice. You were indeed fortunate, Professor, he said, in the fact that your wife, always at the crisis, had strength to resist. In your self-imposed mesmeric state, with your mind keyed to such a delicate pitch, a slip on her part would have meant your death. The gold and onyx clock chimed seven. Carl Stanger laughed. Enough money was spent for that pretty little ornament to feed a starving child a year. Yet right in this house, a person starved, not for food, but for love. Understand, money is not always to be desired. It will not purchase happiness. He glanced curiously from husband to wife. Who am I? He asked of her. She arose to her feet blindly. My dear husband, Adam Armitage, she said, parrot-like, looking straight ahead with dull, wide-opened eyes. The professor struggled madly with the invisible bonds that held him. Understand, Professor, your wife has been faithful to you, indeed, if not in thought, Stanger informed him, and the fault of it all has been your own. The face muscles of the helpless man contracted horribly, his mouth slobbered, and hate shone in his eyes. Stanger turned from the grimacing man to the wife. And how should your husband treat you, who love him dearly, he asked. Vashi glided quickly to his side and kissed his lips. Love me always and not neglect me for a woman who is dead. Stanger laughed again. Then come, my dear. He placed an arm around her waist and led her toward the door. With his hand on the knob, he looked back over his shoulder at the convulsively struggling husband. Go, I command you to your Edith, he cried. The professor's form quieted. An occasional shiver passed through the limp body. Though there was absolute helplessness, insofar as movement was concerned, a look of unspeakable hatred glowed in his eyes. A mocking laugh reached him, as through the open door, he watched his wife and the other ascending the stairs, arm in arm. With the strength of frenzy, he sprang from his chair with hands outstretched. Vashi crept down the silent stairs and listened at the study door. The halls were dark and still. Her heart beat so loudly she mistook its beating for dull footsteps approaching and glanced furtively back of her. A throbbing pulse in her throat ached and the blood hammered her brain. A thin slit of light showed under the door and she drew a quick, painful breath as its significance dawned on her. She turned the handle softly and gently pressed her knee against the panel. It resisted and she turned cold. Adam, she cried, open the door. There was no response, and she called again. Adam, Adam, it is I, Vashi, open the door. Why have you locked yourself in, dear? The silence of the house frightened her. Adam, she cried loudly. Open the door at once. She rattled the knob and pounded with her little hands. She pushed against it once more, and the door gave slightly, as though someone was playfully holding it on the other side. I'm in no humor for joking, Adam. Don't keep me out here. Let me come in. I tell you I am scared. I dreamed you lay by my side, my arms wound around you, your head on my breast. I was so happy in having you all to myself. Oh, Adam, I awoke alone, she gave a sudden push. 
The door yielded slightly. Slowly, unsteadily, it gave way before her, as if something was lying against it. She forced her slim body through the narrow opening and shrieked. She swayed, her senses reeled, her eyes closed, and she threw herself on the crumpled body of her husband, wildly kissing his cold lips.